Good morning. Welcome to the Curry School of Education and thank you for attending the Curry Research Lectureship Series and CRC Keynote Lecture. My name is Kate Peoples and I just finished my PhD in Special Education here at the Curry School. <laughs> Me and like 18 other people, calm down. Um, I am also the chair for this year's Curry Research Conference. The series is sponsored primarily by the Virginia Education Sciences Training, or VEST, Pre-Doctoral Fellowship Program, which is supported by the U.S. Department of Education Institute of Educational Sciences. Today, this talk is part of a full day of research activities through the 10th Annual Curry Research Conference. This student-run conference is an opportunity for undergraduate and graduate students <clears throat> to share their ongoing research with the Curry community. Our program includes a series of poster sessions, which you saw this morning, paper sessions, which you just came from, <laughs> and roundtable discussions in which students receive valuable feedback from their peers and faculty members. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Bettini, Assistant Professor in the Special Education Program at Boston University's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Her work focuses on how working conditions contribute to the instructional quality, stress, and career longevity of special education teachers. Dr. Bettini's latest research has a specific focus on novice special educators who work with students with emotional and behavioral disorders. But she has also recently examined the experiences and perceptions of school and district level special education administration. Dr. Bettini's research has been published in a variety of highly ranked peer reviewed journals and has received funding through the Institute for Education Sciences, the Spencer Foundation and the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, among others. Dr. Bettini's award-winning work is informed by her, years, <laughs> by her years of experience. I just went crazy with the adjectives. <laughs> by her years of experience as a special education teacher serving students with emotional and behavioral disorders. Her focus on the working conditions of special educators is centered on the goal of identifying and defining the causes, consequences, and possible solutions to the issues of recruiting, developing, supporting, and retaining special education teachers in the classrooms that need them most. Dr. Bettini will be speaking for approximately one hour and will leave 15 to 30 minutes for discussion or questions. Please note that any additional or personalized questions after 1230 can be addressed via email as other meetings will beginning, be beginning at this time and also lunch will be beginning at that time. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Bettini. Um, thank you so much. So first of all, just thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. and. Uh, Thanks for that kind introduction, Kate. <laughs> um, I feel like I got really lucky. I got off the plane coming from Boston where it was 27 degrees when I left. Um, and it was like, ah, <laughs> sun. <laughs> so uh, it's really fun and exciting to be here. So thanks, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start by um, having us reflect a little bit on where, we, where you all as scholars and where we collectively as a community locate problems of teaching and learning. Um, and uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the context for my work, which is specifically the, the challenges that are facing the special education teacher workforce. And then I'll share results. Um, I was ambitious and put results from two studies. We probably won't get to the second, um, but I put it in there just in case. And, um, and then I'll talk about kind of my vision for where I would like to see this kind of work go and, and where I hope that we as a field move uh, in, over the course of the next 30 or 40 years. Um, so before I do all that, I just want to acknowledge all of the like phenomenal, wonderful scholars who I get to work with and who are part of the studies that I'll be sharing today, uh, one of whom you all know who's <laughs> right here. <laughs> so um, so I, I want to start, as I said, with a reflection on where, where we locate problems of teaching and learning. And, and when you think about this, I want you to think about where you're doing this within your own work, but then also within your discipline, where are people locating problems of teaching and learning? So I'm gonna start by saying, first of all, on a scale of one to 10, just mentally, you don't have to tell anyone, um, how strong of a teacher were you from like the worst ever to like teacher of the year for the whole world? <laughs> all right, so mentally in your head, have a number. All right. <laughs> and then I want you to think, what are three things that someone could do to set you up to fail? And give me a thumbs up when you have three things. Now turn and tell the person next to you, what are three things someone could do to set you up to fail?
right, so I'm doing the, the signal to all come back. Um, so I know you probably didn't get to talk about all the things, but what were, what were some of the things that someone could do to set you up to fail as a teacher? You can just call out. Go ahead. Yes, very good. What else? Oh, yeah, like the, the mean people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. What else? Oh. Increasing the administrative work, like extra thing, and we also yeah. talk about increasing the number of students in the classroom too. Yeah. Yeah. Giving you too much workload. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, school leader or principal is trying to undercut what you're trying to do. Absolutely. Question, um, the question what you're trying to do. Yeah, undermining. Absolutely. Okay. Conflicting expectations. Yeah, anyone ever experienced that in school? <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice or 10 times or 50? Um, so, <laughs> um, did anyone feel like they couldn't be set up to fail? Does anyone feel like they, I can't, no one could set me up to fail. I'll just say that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Um, because I think we often make the assumption that teachers, we, we don't look at the ways that we as schools set teachers up to fail. It's not, it's not a way that we consider the work of teaching. Um, and yet I feel like often we do set teachers up to fail. We put teachers in positions where uh, they can only succeed by defining success at a very low bar. So uh, here's an example of a place where I, I, I want you to be reflecting on where you situate problems with teaching and learning. So a little context, this is a teacher in a study that we were doing last year. She's in a self-contained class for students with emotional and behavioral disabilities, so that's students with really significant mental health disorders, who've been placed in this setting because of the significance of their behavior challenges. And um, I was taking field notes, I was following her from the time she got in in the morning until the time she left in the evening, and she had a, a broken clock in her classroom. And it was having an effect on her, on her instruction because they needed the clock for data collection. They needed the clock for monitoring when it's time for students to go to other settings. They needed the clock for lots of different things that they, you know, you need to know time in schools, it's important. And um, so I was observing her and her paraprofessionals had come in and these are my field notes. So she was talking with her parents about the clock and she was told by maintenance that, that it was broken and it couldn't be fixed. And her paraprofessionals said, uh, why don't we just buy a, a battery clock? Like a simple solution, right? And she's like, yeah, I don't know. It is what it is, All right? And so in that moment, I felt like this, judgment, right? Like I was like, oh my God, that's so lazy. Or like, that's so helpless. Like she's just like, where is her locus of control? Like she's not, you know, it's a simple, simple solution. Why isn't she doing it? And so there was like a, a moment of judgment. And I imagine some of you are having that moment of judgment right now and it's easy to go to that place. But what I want us to do is to remember that she is situated within a context. She's situated within a school. She's coming from a particular teacher preparation program. She's situated within a policy context. And then all of those things are shaping the way she's reacting in that moment. So what I had observed in that morning was that she had arrived at 6.30 a.m. She was carrying bags of classroom supplies, basic supplies for her class. So she teaches kids with emotional and behavioral disabilities, which means that she has to use reinforcement. Sponsored brand. Ready? Ready? It's gonna be great. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Welcome to the Curry School of Education, and thank you for attending the Curry Research. <laughs> it's 
Good morning. Welcome to the Curry School of Education and thank you for attending the Curry Research Lectureship Series and CRC Keynote Lecture. My name is Kate Peoples and I just finished my PhD in Special Education here at the Curry School. <laughs> Me and like 18 other people, calm down. Um, I am also the chair for this year's Curry Research Conference. The series is sponsored primarily by the Virginia Education Sciences Training or VEST Pre-Doctoral Fellowship Program, which is supported by the U.S. Department of Education Institute of Educational Sciences. Today, this talk is part of a full day of research activities through the 10th Annual Curry Research Conference. This student-run conference is an opportunity for undergraduate and graduate students <clears throat> to share their ongoing research with the Curry community. Our program includes a series of poster sessions, which you saw this morning, paper sessions, which you just came from, <laughs> and roundtable discussions in which students receive valuable feedback from their peers and faculty members. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Bettini, Assistant Professor in the Special Education Program at Boston University's Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Her work focuses on how working conditions contribute to the instructional quality, stress, and career longevity of special education teachers. Dr. Bettini's latest research has a specific focus on novice special educators who work with students with emotional and behavioral disorders. But she has also recently examined the experiences and perceptions of school and district level special education administration. Dr. Bettini's research has been published in a variety of highly ranked peer reviewed journals and has received funding through the Institute for Education Sciences, the Spencer Foundation and the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, among others. Dr. Bettini's award-winning work is informed by her, years, <laughs> by her years of experience, I just went crazy with the adjectives, <laughs> by her years of experience as a special education teacher serving students with emotional and behavioral disorders. Her focus on the working conditions of special educators is centered on the goal of identifying and defining the causes, consequences, and possible solutions to the issues of recruiting, developing, supporting, and retaining special education teachers in the classrooms that need them most. Dr. Bettini will be speaking for approximately one hour and will leave 15 to 30 minutes for discussion or questions. Please note that any additional or personalized questions after 1230 can be addressed via email as other meetings will beginning, be beginning at this time and also lunch will be beginning at that time. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Bettini. Um, thank you so much. So first of all, just thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. and. Uh, Thanks for that kind introduction, Kate. <laughs> um, I feel like I got really lucky. I got off the plane coming from Boston where it was 27 degrees when I left. Um, and it was like, ah, oh, <laughs> sun. <laughs> so uh, it's really fun and exciting to be here. So thanks, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start by um, having us reflect a little bit on where, we, where you all as scholars and where we collectively as a community locate problems of teaching and learning. Um, and. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the, the context for my work, which is specifically the, the challenges that are facing the special education teacher workforce. And then I'll share results. Um, I was ambitious and put results from two studies. We probably won't get to the second, um, but I put it in there just in case. And, um, and then I'll talk about kind of my vision for where I would like to see this kind of work go and, and where I hope that we as a field move uh, in, over the course of the next 30 or 40 years. Um, so before I do all that, I just want to acknowledge all of the like phenomenal, wonderful scholars who I get to work with and who are part of the studies that I'll be sharing today, uh, one of whom you all know, who's <laughs> right here. <laughs> so um, so I, I want to start, as I said, with a reflection on where, where we locate problems of teaching and learning. And, and when you think about this, I want you to think about where you're doing this within your own work, but then also within your discipline, where are people locating problems of teaching and learning? So I want to start by saying, first of all, on a scale of one to 10, just mentally, you don't have to tell anyone, um, how strong of a teacher were you from like the worst ever to like teacher of the year for the whole world? <laughs> all right, so mentally in your head, have a number. All right. <laughs> and then I want you to think, what are three things that someone could do to set you up to fail? And give me a thumbs up when you have three things. Okay. Now turn and tell the person next to you, what are three things someone could do to set you up to fail?
right, so I'm doing the, the signal that I'll come back. Um, so I know you probably didn't get to talk about all the things, but what were, what were some of the things that someone could do to set you up to fail as a teacher? You can just call that. Go ahead. Yes, very good. What else? Oh, yeah, like the, the mean people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. What else? Oh. Increasing the administrative work, like extra thing, and we also yeah. talk about increasing the number of students in the classroom too. Yeah. Yeah. Giving you too much workload. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, school leader or principal is trying to undercut what you're trying to do. Absolutely. I'm questioning what you're trying to do. Yeah, undermining. Absolutely. Okay. Conflicting expectations. Yeah, anyone ever experienced that in school? <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice or 10 times or 50? Um, so, <laughs> um, did anyone feel like they couldn't be set up to fail? Does anyone feel like they, I can't, no one can set me up to fail, I'll just <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, because I think we often make the assumption that teachers, we, we don't look at the ways that we as schools set teachers up to fail. It's not, it's not a way that we consider the work of teaching. Um, and yet I feel like often we do set teachers up to fail. We put teachers in positions where uh, they can only succeed by defining success at a very low bar. So uh, here's an example of a place where I, I, I want you to be reflecting on where you situate problems with teaching and learning. So a little context, this is a teacher in a study that we were doing last year. She's in a self-contained class for students with emotional and behavioral disabilities, so that's students with really significant mental health disorders who've been placed in this setting because of the significance of their behavior challenges. And um, I was taking field notes, I was following her from the time she got in in the morning until the time she left in the evening, and she had a, a broken clock in her classroom. And it was having an effect on her, on her instruction because they needed the clock for data collection. They needed the clock for monitoring when it's time for students to go to other settings. They needed the clock for lots of different things that they, you know, you need to know time in schools, it's important. And um, so I was observing her and her paraprofessionals had come in and these are my field notes. So she was talking with her parents about the clock and she was told by maintenance that, that it was broken and it couldn't be fixed. And her paraprofessionals said, uh, why don't we just buy a, a battery clock? Like a simple solution, right? And she's like, yeah, I don't know. It is what it is, All right? And so in that moment, I felt like this, judgment, right? Like I was like, oh my God, that's so lazy. Or like, that's so helpless. Like she's just like, where is her locus of control? Like she's not, you know, it's a simple, simple solution. Why isn't she doing it? And so there was like a, a moment of judgment. And I imagine some of you are having that moment of judgment right now and it's easy to go to that place. But what I want us to do is to remember that she is situated within a context. She's situated within a school. She's coming from a particular teacher preparation program. She's situated within a policy context. And then all of those things are shaping the way she's reacting in that moment. So what I had observed in that morning was that she had arrived at 6.30 a.m. She was carrying bags of classroom supplies, basic supplies for her class. So she teaches kids with emotional and behavioral disabilities, which means that she has to use reinforcement systems. And she was trying to use them and trying to use them effectively, but she had no budget. So she had purchased them all at Target herself the night before. And she's in Boston, which is not a cheap area to live, and she's not in a high paying district. So she's spending a lot of her personal money that she needs for her family. She's spending that on basic supplies for her classroom. She has no curriculum. Literally a single first grade Houghton Mifflin text teaching kindergarten through fifth grade. She found it in the copy room. It wasn't given to her. That's her only curriculum. So she needs to buy curriculum as well. She has no scheduled planning time. There is no, she has no schedule, period. And her, she has students in her class all day. So there's no scheduled time for her to take a break. There's no time for her to think through what she's gonna do the next day. She has no, her paraprofessionals, she met them on day one when students came in. She had no scheduled time to pick, train her paraprofessionals. She has no scheduled routine time to coordinate paraprofessionals work. Paraprofessionals hours start 10 minutes before kids get in. That 10 minutes when she's interacting with Amina is the only time that she has potential to train her paraprofessional staff. And so when I see all this, I'm like, yeah, a clock is a simple solution but she's got bigger fish to fry. Like she's gonna have to buy herself curriculum, you know? She's buying curriculum off of Teachers Pay Teacher. She's going to Pinterest, right? She's begging for stuff from her colleagues, but she has no time to interact with her colleagues because she has no plan time. She's got kids from the time that she comes in until the time that the day ends. And so when I see all this, I can step back from that judgment and say, this clock issue, it, she's giving up on the clock issue because she's triaging, right? 
It's not that she's lazy. It's not that she doesn't care. It's not that she has a poor locus of control. It's that there is a set of circumstances around her. All right. So what I want us to always be doing is when we see problems with teaching, as we go through this presentation, what I always try to do in my work and what I'd encourage you to at least sometimes do in your work is when we see problems with teaching, ask what are the problems that are leading to it. Ask about the context in which that teaching is happening. All right, so I think uh, when, the way that I approach this is I use the word working conditions. Other people use other terms like school context or social context, et cetera. Um, so I am interested in the ways that schools and districts can foster a healthy teacher workforce by providing supportive working conditions for their teachers. And when I talk about working conditions, I'm talking about the social context of the school, so school culture, uh, collegial interactions, the kinds of interactions that are fostered within the school, the opportunities for collegial interactions, the nature of administrative support, um, the professional learning experiences within the school. I'm also talking about the logistical supports that teachers have for their work. So time for instruction in special education, time with small instructional groups who share common instructional needs, and material resources including curriculum, reinforcement systems, all of the things that we need to make a classroom work. And then I'm also talking about the demands that are placed on teachers, the paperwork responsibilities, the extra supervision, all of the other things that teachers have to do in addition to instruction. I'm not talking about student demographics. Sometimes people will talk about student demographics as a working condition. I don't conceptualize it that way. I think that the students are who we serve. They are not a condition of the work. Um, I'm also not talking about salaries, although I think that they are super important, and I, I value work that people are doing on those. It's just it's something that when I talk to principals, they don't feel like they have control over, so I tend to kind of set it aside. All right, so I think there are a lot of pathways. We have some evidence that there are quite a lot of pathways by which working conditions might be shaping the quality and the effectiveness of our, our teacher workforce. So if you think about a teacher who, you know, they enter at the very beginning, and this arrow represents their career. Um, there are pathways by which working conditions might be affecting who enters and where they choose to go, what kinds of schools they choose to go to. Um, working conditions may be shaping whether or not they experience success, um, whether they feel successful, whether they feel like they have to invest too much in order to feel successful. And then there are obviously relationships between working conditions and who leaves, um, when do they leave, what schools do they leave from, and where do they choose to go afterwards. Um, and most of my research is focused on those latter two components, their teacher's experiences teaching and their, their exit from the profession. So in education policy, we have uh, an emerging body of research showing us that there are relationships between working conditions and instructional quality and effectiveness. Um, so as an example, here's a study by uh, Jackson and McCarran in 2016 where they were looking at what's the effect of just giving teachers these seven uh, anchor lessons for their math instruction, what's the effect on their, their effectiveness in teaching students, and they found that uh, teachers who were provided with, this, with these materials, um, their effectiveness improved substantially in the following year, and it was most effective for the teachers who were least effective initially. So just providing teachers curriculum is super important, as, as like folks in math ed can tell you like for days, right? Um, Here's another study, so that's kind of the, lo the logistical side. Here's on the social side. So this is a, a paper by uh, Matt Kraft and John Pape from 2014. So they were looking at a large district in North Carolina. And um, what you see here is on the bottom, you've got teachers' years of experience. And on the left-hand side, you've got their, um, their students' mathematic achievements, so the, their value-added scores. And as you know, is always the case, teachers improve substantially in their first three years. Um, but what these lines represent is their school's percentile in terms of collaboration. So schools that were at the 75th percentile in terms of a collaborative culture, teachers improved more rapidly. Schools that were at the 25th percentile in terms of a collaborative culture, teachers improved more slowly and didn't ever get quite as high as the teachers who were in a more collaborative environment. So the degree to which the school culture fosters collaboration within the school is related to the extent to which teachers are improving in their effectiveness over time. So we know that there are, there's that, that's a growing body of research. It's a really exciting body of research. Um, I'm not sure where someone in here is studying with them next year, which is really awesome. There you go, yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, and then we also have a, you know, a really robust body of research showing us that working conditions shape teachers' decisions to continue teaching. Um, so here's kind of a classic study by uh, Sue Moore Johnson and also by <laughs> the same folks, John, uh, John Pepe and Matt Kraft. Um, so what we have here is teachers, uh, teachers' colleagues' ratings of the school culture and climate and working conditions. 
Um, and so here's schools that were in the zero percentile, here's schools that were in the 100th percentile, and then here's the odds ratio of a, of a given teacher leaving as a function of their colleagues' ratings of working conditions. Um, and that's consistent with a, a really much more robust body of research that's been around for a long time. All right. So um, I tend to do that kind of work situated speci uh, specifically within the special education teacher workforce. And so um, to give you guys a little bit of background on the special education teacher workforce, I'm going to do that before I talk about the studies. So um, am I on time? All right, so in the special education teacher workforce, we have a lot of challenges facing our, our teachers. So we have uh, dramatic shortages that are pervasive across the whole country. Um, we have an inequitable distribution of, of qualified special education teachers across schools based on uh, student race, student socioeconomic status, and based on whether students are placed in inclusive settings versus more exclusionary settings. So our like, alternative schools, special education schools, the teachers tend to be less experienced, less qualified, et cetera. Um, we also have dramatic shortages of teachers of color. About half of students with disabilities are kids of color, and only 18% of our teachers are teachers of color. Um, there is some evidence that special education teachers experience higher rates of burnout and early career attrition than general education teachers. Um, and there's also some evidence that they experience more ambiguity and conflict in their roles. Dr. Jones. <laughs> um, and there are well-documented problems with instructional quality. Um, the practices that we know from research to be effective, the practices that we try to train our folks to go out and, and enact in schools are not getting enacted in the ways that we would like. And all of those issues are exacerbated for special educators who work with students with emotional and behavioral disabilities. So, for example, a special education teacher who teaches 100% students with EDD is four times more likely to leave in a given year than a special educator who teaches 0%. Uh, that's a paper that's impressed by Ali Gilmore. Um, much more significant problems with this population of teachers. They're less likely to be qualified, less likely to be experienced, less likely to stay over the long haul, more stressed, more burned out. Um, and that's really concerning because students with emotional and behavioral disabilities are students with significant mental health disorders. They, compared to other students with disabilities, they have the highest risk of all sorts of negative long-term outcomes, highest risk of dropping out, of being incarcerated, of being unemployed. And all of those risks can be mitigated. There are, there are highly effective uh, interventions that can mitigate or address those risks. Um, and the fact that we do not have a robust population of special education teachers who are able to mitigate those risks is really concerning. It has long-term negative impacts for the students, for their families, and for society as a whole. So the students with the most significant emotional and behavioral disabilities are typically placed in self-contained special education settings. So these include self-contained classes within general education schools, as well as separate therapeutic day schools uh, that are in, uh, and residential schools, wilderness schools, other kinds of alternative schooling. Um, about 35% of kids with EBD are served in those settings. So it's a very small population of students. Students with EBD are about 1% of the population overall. This is 35% of that 1%. Um, and they're supposed to be placed in those settings to receive the most effective, the most intensive interventions, and yet there's pretty well-documented problems with the quality of instruction and the quality of services in those settings that is directly related to the fact that we have a hard time keeping folks there. Um, we have a hard time keeping folks, and we have a hard time supporting them in those settings. So coming back to this graphic, um, I think there's a, a, a lot of work trying to provide te those teachers with professional development, try to improve their knowledge and their skill, and that work is, is growing and is exciting, and I'm glad that it's out there. But where my lens is, is what are we doing in school systems to support them so that they feel successful, so that they're able to be successful and enact effective practices, and so that they want to stay over the long haul. So there's a really small body of research on working conditions for these teachers. Um, we did a systematic literature review a few years ago. We looked back to 1990, and we found only 10 studies. Um, those studies showed that these teachers tend to be quite isolated from their colleagues. Um, they experience a little more support for behavior than academics, and they report that their colleagues and their administrators don't understand or value their roles. Um, so other people will, you know, here's an example. A teacher said, people think, oh, they're in a self-contained room. They're just playing games all day. They thought it was just babysitting, like a holding spot for throwaway kids. So that's the message that she's getting from her colleagues about the nature of her work, um, work that she obviously values. 
as far as logistical resources, um, the only study that we looked at that had looked at planning time was from 1990, so this is dated. Um, but they found that 45% of these teachers had less than 30 minutes of planning time per day. 24% reported having very poor access to curricula. Um, and they are on average uh, tasked with teaching multiple subjects and grade levels. Because it's such a small population of students, districts do not have the, uh, the, the critical mass to create more than one class, for example, at the elementary level. Um, and then there's also documentation that they have many extra responsibilities outside of just you know, teaching this high, high risk population of kiddos. So in the first study that I'm gonna share, this was funded by the, the Spencer Foundation and it, it was in collaboration with uh, Michelle Cumming, Kristen Merrill O'Brien, Nelson Brunsting, Ma Ragunathan, and Rachel Sutton, who didn't get me her picture in time. But, <laughs> um, but she was a big part of the study, so. Um, so our purpose here was to examine how different working conditions interact with one another to predict these special education teachers' stress, their burnout, and their intent to leave teaching. Um, so that we can inform efforts to improve those working conditions. So we developed a, a survey, and it was informed by two different conceptual foundations. So the first was a um, theory of what working conditions shape special education teachers' experience that we developed in, uh, in our literature review. Um, so we hypothesized that working conditions are shaping their opportunities to learn, to plan, and to teach effectively. Um, and we drew, they helped us identify which working conditions were most important to include in our survey. Um, and then we also drew on conservation of resources theory, which comes out of organizational uh, psychology. Um, and we used it to conceptualize how those working conditions relate to one another. Um, so the theory is that in any kind of, uh, kind of job, you have a set of demands and you have a set of resources for meeting those demands. And when the demands and the resources are in balance, you experience manageable stress and positive affective outcomes. But when the demands exceed your resources to fulfill them, then that's when you have teachers experience negative affective outcomes, such as stress, burnout, uh, intent to leave. Um, so based on the working conditions that we had identified in our literature review and this theory, we decided to focus on uh, logistical resources, including planning time and curricular materials, social resources, including school culture, uh, administrative support, and paraprofessional support, demands, including instructional grouping, so how many students are in the class, how, what's the heterogeneity of their academic needs, um, the number of students served, and the number of different content areas and grade levels for which folks had to plan. Um, and then we looked at affective outcomes, including perceptions of workload manageability, stress, and emotional exhaustion, and we were looking at whether those things predicted intent to leave teaching. So we developed the survey using existing scales. Um, we drew some from Dr. Young's earlier work from the Michigan Indiana Early Career Teacher Study. We drew some from the Schools and Staffing Survey, um, other publicly available surveys. Um, where necessary, we developed items and scales based on qualitative data that we had previously collected for another project. Um, and we did think aloud cognitive interviews with eight special educators to refine the items and, and there were things we had to change in order to, to ensure people understood what we were talking about. Um, we also had an expert review panel, including Dr. Hannah Matthews, so, who provided feedback on the survey items and helped us ensure that we had some, uh, some content validity. Um, we wanted to have a national sample of um, special educators in these self-contained classes. Uh, it is a very small population of teachers, so if, if it's you know, one third of one percent of students, <laughs> it is also a very small population of teachers. So a national sample was hard. So we stratified U.S. school districts uh, by size. We didn't stratify by region, which I think was an error and something that we would do if we were to do it again. Um, randomly selected 25 districts per stratum and then cold called for six months and were miserable until we got a lot of districts to agree to be part of the study. Um, we wound up with a final sample of 41 districts spread across the country. Um, there's a little over-representation of the South. Um, so that's you know, not stratifying by region. Uh, impaired our ability to say that it's nationally representative. So it is a national study, it's not necessarily nationally representative. Um, so we, had, we recruited and, and uh, administered the survey in fall of 2017 and spring of 2018. Um, for each, what we first did was we recruited the district special education directors, then they emailed the survey to uh, the special education teachers. Uh, across those 41 districts, there were a total of 459 special educators who were eligible for the study. Um, and we embedded some skip logic to confirm that they actually were eligible in the beginning. So there were a number of teachers who responded but had to be booted from the survey because they did not in fact teach kids with EDD or they were not in fact in a self-contained setting. 
Um, after one week, we sent a reminder email, and then after two weeks, we sent them a paper copy with a $2 bill. Um, everyone got the $2 bill. It's just a way to build goodwill with your participants so that they're more likely to respond. Um, so we had a 51% response rate, a total of 236 responses, of whom 171 were members of the target population. Um, so there were 65 who uh, should not have been ever sent the survey in the first place. All right. Um, it was about 72% female, 28% male, so it's a little more male than the special education teacher population overall, but that's consistent with teachers of students with EDD. Um, and same thing with race, it is 72% uh, white, so it's a little more uh, racially diverse than the special education teacher population overall. Um, again, that's consistent with what we know about teachers of students with EDD. They tend to be more likely to be male and more likely to be people of color than other special education teachers. 58% um, reported holding a bat um, master's degree. 27% were uncertified, so almost a third did not have a certificate at all. And more than a third did not have a special education teaching certificate. Um, they were fairly experienced. The average experience was 13 years overall, five years in their current school. 18% uh, were in a se separate special education school, and 82% were in a general education school. And they taught an average of nine students, of whom eight had emotional and behavioral disabilities. Um, so we use structural equation modeling to test complex relationships among their, their resources and their demands, their affective outcomes, and their intent to continue teaching in this population of students. Um, so first we use CFA to measure each of our scales, to ensure each of our scales measured a, a unidimensional latent construct. Um, so we had a, a number of scales. I don't know why it keeps flashing. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I'm not going to share with you all of the CFAs. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you a couple of the more important ones just so you can see what we were doing. So we were testing to ensure we wanted a non-significant chi-square, uh, an RNSCA below 0.10, ideally with a CI including 0.05, um, CFI and GLI above 0.9. So that in indicates that the scale, uh, that those items work together to measure a, a latent construct. Um, so for example, our workload manageability scale is items like, I feel I'm working too hard on my job, there's too much work to do, I have enough time within designated school hours to do my job well, administrative duties and paperwork interfere with my instructional responsibilities, and my workload is manageable. Um, and I'm not going to bore you with all the CFAs. But, um, so what we wanted to test was whether affective responses, perceptions of workload manageability, stress, emotional exhaustion, and intent to stay. I think I forgot to tell you, emotional exhaustion is a subconstruct of, of burnout. Um, so it's when people feel like they have no more to give of themselves emotionally to their class and their students. Um, we wanted to test whether those were related to the social context of their work, their administrative support, school culture, paraprofessional support, the logistical context of their work, so their planning time and their curricular resources, and the demands that were placed on them the students they were assigned to teach, the number of students, the number of lessons they had to plan. Um, so does anyone know what the problem is here? Someone with, uh, with SEM, what was my sample size? <laughs> so, th so this is a lot of parameters, right? And we had a sample of 171. Um, and there's no way you can test all this with 171. Um, so what we did was we tested it one piece at a time. So we tested first the affective responses, and then we tested whether the social resources related to those, and then whether the logistical resources related to those, and then whether the demands related to those, and then we took all of the significant effects from all of those models and we put them together. Um, and that allowed us to do a more complex analysis with a relatively small sample. So um, first, we found that our hypotheses about workload manageability, <coughs> predicting stress and emotional exhaustion were borne out. So this indicates that a one standard deviation change in workload manageability was associated with a 0.61 standard deviation change in emotional exhaustion. And emotional exhaustion mediated a relationship between workload manageability and intent to continue teaching. Stress did not. Stress did not significantly directly relate to intent to stay. That was the one part of this model that was not borne out. That was also mediated by emotional exhaustion. We then looked at the social resources, and what we found here was um, the only social resources that were related to workload manageability were perceptions of paraprofessional training and administrative support, as well as the number of paraprofessionals. Um, now, it is, it is noteworthy that administrative support predicted 
all of the social context variables, which is something that folks had thought was the case, but we hadn't tested in special education. And so that, that was true. Um, but they, these didn't then go on to contribute to workload manageability. One interesting thing here is that the coefficient is negative. So that means that folks who were supervised had more paraprofessionals to support them actually felt more overwhelmed. And that was contrary to our hypotheses. We had thought that adding paraprofessionals would help feel, folks feel like they had more support, um, but it, it's more people to supervise. And so they didn't feel that way. Um, we did a couple of post hoc tests to, to see if that might be moderated by perceptions of paraprofessional training, and it was not. Even when they felt like their paraprofessionals were very well trained, um, even when they really trusted their paraprofessionals, that relationship between the number of paraprofessionals and workload manageability remained significant and in the negative direction. So that was interesting. All right, so we next tested logistical resources. Um, all of the, our hypotheses were borne out here. So um, folks who rated their curricular resources more highly felt their workloads were more manageable, and workload manageability fully mediated a relationship with intent to stay. Folks who felt that their planning time was more adequate felt that their workloads were more manageable, and then this mediated a relationship with these outcomes. Folks who spent more hours planning outside the school day felt their workloads were less manageable, and then again, that mediated the relationship. These coefficients are quite large, so this indicates that a one standard deviation change in ratings of planning time is associated with a .552 standard deviation change in workload manageability. The effect from planning time to intent to stay was like .35. So one standard deviation change in planning time was associated with a .35 standard deviation change in intent to continue teaching. So this was, was a pretty powerful variable. All right, demands. Um, so what you'll see here is that uh, there's a couple of interesting things. So instructional grouping is their ratings of the extent to which students share common instructional needs, right? So it's not perceptions of class size. It's do my students, can I meet all of my students' needs within a single lesson? Um, and that was significantly associated with workload manageability, which then mediated those other relationships. Um, so did the number of lessons that, so having to plan more lessons led folks to feel like their workloads were less manageable. The surprising finding was number of students. So if people who had more students actually said that their workloads were more manageable. And so we were curious why that was. It was opposed to our hypotheses. And so we tested an interaction term between these two variables, and the interaction was significant. So folks who felt that their instructional groups were um, more diverse and did not share some common instructional needs, for them, this coefficient was negative. For folks who had shared instructional needs in their class, this coefficient was positive. So because we, had, uh, we were doing a complex model with a fairly small sample, we couldn't test mediated and moderated effects at the same time, so we dropped number of students from the subsequent analyses. All right, all right so finally we put it all together. Um, and there's two things I want you to note about this model. The first is that we decided to add experience teaching in at the, at the end because that's something that's been important in predicting intent to leave in previous studies. Um, it was not significant after controlling for all of these other things, um, which implies that perhaps the higher intent to leave among early career teachers could be explained by differences in access to quality working conditions for early career teachers versus later career teachers. That's one, one possible explanation. The other thing worth noticing here is that once we put planning time into the model with everything else, planning time is really powerful and a lot of other things become non-significant. So we did a post hoc test to see whether planning time might explain relationships between other working conditions and those outcomes, um, and it did. So folks who had better curricular resources said that their planning time was more adequate. So if you think about you're having to plan for three grade levels across four subject areas and you have no curricular resources, you're gonna need more planning time. As opposed to someone who is doing the same exact instructional responsibilities, but who has all of the resources they need for each grade level and knows how to use them. Same thing with instructional grouping. Folks who felt that their students shared common instructional needs said that their planning time was stronger, was more adequate. Um, folks who had more diverse student needs in their class so that their planning time was less adequate. So it's the same thing. If you're planning for students who are, you're having to provide intensive reading intervention to students who are reading anywhere from kindergarten through 10th grade, which I had to do my first year teaching, right? I had students in my class who were in middle school who read in kindergarten level, and I had students who were reading at the 10th grade level who didn't, who didn't comprehend, then you have a lot more work to do to plan your lessons than if you're teaching all students who are reading at the same level. Um, 
Perceptions of the adequacy of planning time were also related to the number of hours they spent planning outside of school. Um, all of these relationships were fully mediated. So curricular resources did have a relationship with intent to stay that was fully mediated by planning time, workload manageability, emotional exhaustion. All right, so those pathways were significant all the way through to the end. All right, so I think one of my big takeaways from this is that we just, first of all, workload manageability is a really powerful construct that helps us understand the ways that working conditions relate to these outcomes. Um, and I think one of the things that makes working, workload manageability an exciting construct is, is, is that it's one that I can see adapting for repeated measurement. So if we wanted to go in and improve a working condition, we could measure workload manageability repeatedly as an outcome of that intervention to try to improve something. The other thing is that we have nothing on planning time. Like, I, I was asking the best scholars earlier, raise your hand if you know a study about planning time, and no one raised their hand. <laughs> I know one from 1996, um, she found that uh, planning, the teachers' perceptions of the adequacy of planning time was the only thing that differentiated people who implemented an, a PD with fidelity from teachers who did not. No one has followed up on that. No one has looked up and said, does the adequacy of planning time moderate the, the degree to which teachers, teachers take up what they learn in professional development? Does the, does the adequacy of planning time contribute to the quality of teachers' instruction that they plan? Does it contribute to the ways they make decisions about, their, about what they're going to do instructionally? We don't know anything about planning time. And th th these models would suggest that it's a really powerful factor that is interacting with other working conditions and it's interacting with the ways teachers experience their work and the decisions they make about whether or not they want to continue teaching. Um, so I would say, go do it. <laughs> um, all right. So I think I have time for a really quick one run through on study two. Um, so this is a, a very different study. This was. A, um, it was a study that emerged from a study funded by IES, so um, it was not what uh, IES, all, I'm also doing the things that they intended for me to do, but this is a, one that I got to do as a side of, of having been funded through IES. So um, my collaborators on this, I have, uh, I'm working on this with uh, Jen Lillis, Nelson Brunsting, and Christabel Stark, and also uh, Nate Jones and Stephen Smith are mentors for the project. So I acknowledge all of those guys. Um, so this focuses really on understanding the nature of teachers' experiences in their profession, in their job. Um, and in particular, teachers of students with emotional and behavioral disabilities and their experiences of their social context. So the, the rationale for this is that, you know, thumbs up if you're familiar with Lordy and the egg, egg crate model. Uh, I, see, I see some people who are looking at me like kind of weird. <laughs> okay, so, so the idea is that traditionally teachers have been like eggs in an egg crate, right? And they are in their class, their class is the egg crate, the teacher is the egg, and they do not mix, they do not interact. Teaching is siloed, independent, isolated work. And that that was traditionally the case. And there have been a lot of efforts over the last 30 years to really change that, to coordinate teachers' work. Um, those efforts have been aimed at um, you know, some of them have been things like standards and evaluation tools and collaborative professional development that have been aimed at ensuring consistency in curricular methods and curricular content across the school. And then some have been things like multi-tiered systems of support, co-teaching, RTI, PBIS, that have been aimed at drawing on the expertise of people, uh, drawing on the diverse expertise within a school to more effectively serve students who struggle, students who with more complex needs. Um, and this has affected students with EDD, including those students with the most significant uh, emotional and behavioral disabilities. So back in 1997, only 25% of students with EDD were in inclusive settings. Um, currently, it's closer to 50%, almost double. And the number of students who are in self-contained classes has been declining, um, down to where it's now about 20%. Um, and so what seems to be happening is that teachers of students with EDD are no longer able to stay in our egg crates. I think we were, I was in an egg crate. <laughs> and I think we kind of maybe stayed in our egg crates a little longer than the rest of education. Um, and so the, you know, the larger study that we're conducting is to understand how working conditions shape instructional quality in these self-contained settings for students with EBD. Um, and year one, we were using mixed methods and generating hypotheses. Um, and one of the things we realized in that year was that the self-contained model was more flexible and more inclusively oriented than we had anticipated. That a big part of the teacher's job was not just teaching the teachers in their, their self-contained class, as we found in previous studies. A big part of it was moving them out into general education classes. 
Um, and so the students in these classes had a special education teacher, but they were also cross-listed with a general education teacher. And some of them spent zero time here. Um, but the idea was that over the year, they were progressively moving more into the general education teacher's class. Um, and so that, that egg crate was being replaced with a more coordinated kind of system for students with significant EBD. Um, and in a previous study, we had looked at these teachers' roles, and we hadn't found anything about that. We hadn't found anything about coordinating their work with other, with other professionals. Um, and so it seemed like maybe there was something that we missed and that we needed to understand better that was different in some of the contexts we're in this year. So our research questions were, um, what is the nature of the interpersonal dynamics that special educators experience in these inclusion-focused, self-contained settings for students with EDD? What shapes those dynamics? And then how do they experience and negotiate those dynamics? So we used, uh, we were looking at this qualitatively. We came from a constructivist perspective where we're really valuing how the participants understand and construct their own experiences. Um, we were seeking insider perspectives, so we're trying really hard not to lay our, our judgments or our, uh, you know, all the categories that we have in our brains. We're trying not to lay those onto to what teachers say. Um, our participants were five special educators. We had, a larger, we had a sample of eight, and these were the five who were in inclusion-focused programs. Um, they were all teaching at elementary. They all had two to six years of experience. Um, they were all female, fully certified through traditional preparation programs. Amelia, who I mentioned at the beginning, was one of them. Um, and they were all teaching in schools with a strong emphasis on inclusion, where that was a, a core part of their role, was moving students into general education settings. So we conducted three interviews with each teacher, fall, winter, and spring. Um, the interviews were on the semi end of semi-structured. <laughs> um, so I was really doing a lot of follow-up questions with teachers, allowing the conversation to go places that they led it. Um, it was, you know, as I said, part of a larger study, so we do have other data on these teachers, but what we're analyzing for this study is, are those interviews. Um, so we're using constructivist grounded theory, where we're trying to generate theory inductively from the data. Um, we've gone through an iterative coding process, um, you know, initial codes that are very open, and then moving towards more greater abstraction uh, in, in applying labels to what they're experiencing. So uh, we are all, uh, for all, all of the, the research team, we're all researchers with you know, different backgrounds and perspectives, and we tried to be really explicit about those uh, to help us uh, hold one another accountable for reducing our biases in, in, in our interpretations of the data. Um, we all are former special educators. We have very different experiences working with kids with EDD, some of us in inclusive settings. One person used to be in wilderness schools. He taught for three years like up in the mountains with kids with EDD. Uh, so very different kinds of backgrounds that we're bringing to bear on the data. And we also have different perspectives on special education teacher quality issues more broadly. Um, and so those perspectives, help, we, we use those to help us provide insight into what te teachers are saying. Um, and, but we also try to hold ourselves accountable for not allowing those to be imposed upon the data. Um, so we have been engaging, to help us do that, we've been engaging in peer debriefing, we've been uh, engaging in uh, systematically searching for disconfirming evidence for the kinds of things that we're finding. Um, we've begun member checking, so I shared, recently I shared the results with Amelia, and she was like, yes, <laughs> so that was affirming, um, and we, we're going to begin eventually uh, triangulating among data sources. So this, this analysis is not complete, it's in process. Um, so here are some of our preliminary results. Uh, the, the first is that their job goes so far beyond teaching. It's not standing in front of students just teaching. Um, the students who they're serving are served by staff within the self-contained program, paraprofessionals, sometimes a part-time BCBA or adjustment counselor. That's the term in Massachusetts for a school counselor. Um, they're often served by other specialists, both within and outside of the school. So you know, they might have a uh, therapist outside of school or a psychiatrist who the teacher has to talk to occasionally, as well as within the school, they might have a, a speech language pathologist or an OT. They're served by general educators and the school at large and they are served by the district. So these are students who are placed in this program by the district. The district has an investment in ensuring that they're successful. The district is keeping tabs on what's happening. And so because the student is served by all of these different folks, the teacher has to coordinate all of those different folks. The teacher has to make sure that all of those different groups are coordinating their work to give the student what they need. 
And so here's an example. One of our participants, Eve, said, I think it's this crazy combination of academics, behavior, social, emotional, scheduling, dealing with staff scheduling, trying to train and then dealing with the gen ed teachers. There's this outer ring of gen ed teachers, other sped teachers, all my colleagues, and then admin. I just feel it's these layers of potential issues and people to try to please. That's nothing about the kids, right? That's like all the, the adults she's having to coordinate. And so there were a lot of activities that they took on in order to coordinate those other adults. So they were managing other people's emotions, educating other adults, triaging when, when there were not enough resources to go around. Who's going to get their lunch break? Which kid is going to get staffed? Scheduling, negotiating tensions. And I'm going to zoom in on negotiating tensions. So there were tensions with colleagues and administrators that were driven by three kind of core things. The first was the division of responsibilities. Who is responsible for doing what for whom? And that was a tension that they had with everybody. <laughs> um, they could have with everybody. Not everyone had it with everyone, but it was possible to have with everyone. There was a tension around understanding kids with EBD and behavior um, that they tended to have with everyone. Um, paraprofessionals, other folks in their program, principals, gen ed colleagues, everyone. There were not shared understandings of how to serve this population of students. And then with administrators, they often had tensions around resources, para, uh, staffing, curriculum, space. So for example, here's Fiona talking about attention that gets at both the understanding of EBD and the division of responsibilities. So she says the student could go from 0 to 10 very quickly. So we had him put in place a progression of how he would enter back into the general education classroom. But for the general educator, it was hard for her to see because while he was in there, he was successful. So she didn't really see what was happening in here and why we were making those decisions that for his safety, they were keeping him out of the, cl the gen ed class. She saw him in a good place, and I think it was a challenge for her to accept, and then it became difficult for me to do my job. We wanted to mimic identical, the instruction. We wanted to mimic identical to everything he was missing in the classroom because she didn't want him to miss out on instruction, miss out on content. Sometimes that teacher wouldn't provide the materials he needed or sit with me and talk about how the lessons that were missed and how we could go about making him successful. And as a consequence, that student wound up being held back because he missed so much instruction and she couldn't make it up. She didn't have the material. She didn't have the things that she needed to make up what he was missing in his gen ed class. And he wound up being held back in kindergarten. Um, so it was the, both the division of responsibilities, what was the general educator's responsibility in this context, as well as her understanding of the student's needs. Here's another example. This is more with a, an administrator. What would happen was I'd be going to help with behaviors, and sometimes it takes two to three people for a significant behavior. And then little Johnny over here is supposed to be getting instruction, and he didn't get any. So we need to hire someone separate that can just focus on academics. So that was her advocating with her administrators and having tension with her administrators over the resources that were available, the personnel resources available for her class. All right, so they had a lot of different strategies that they used to deal with this. Um, to deal with these tensions. So uh, one was just getting by. So an example, Amelia said, I'm just getting through one day at a time right now. Today's Tuesday, right? I'm trying to get through Tuesday. You kind of do the path of least resistance. Some teachers talked about sacrificing. So Fiona talked about when you're bringing all your paperwork home, everyone else has that time during the day for the next lesson, so on and so forth. But of course, we want to look at all our students and do what's best for them, so we do make those sacrifices. So they would always sacrifice themselves first, then paras, and then kids. Kids were always the the priority. Um, some teachers were engaging in a lot of self-advocacy, advocating for change within their program. So this is a, an extension of that quote I shared before with Greta. I don't have the academic background, so once we started getting more kids, I said, listen, there are two things. You need to send me someone to train. I can't do it all. Managing behaviors in itself is a full-time job. And then she provided data to support that. So she brought data to her principals about how much her students were missing instruction because of behavioral things that she had to attend to. Um, a lot of teachers invested in educating their colleagues and other folks around them. So Eve said, Eve, here's a, she's explaining about a, uh, a general education teacher who doesn't want to let the kid take a sensory break. And she's like, no, 30 minutes. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is a different one. That's, sorry, that's a quote I had before. <laughs> so, uh, so this is actually with her administrator. Her administrator is saying, like, she's fine. You can pull the paraprofessional off. And she's like, no, that paraprofessional is why the student is successful. And she's having to educate her principal about her student's needs. Um, here's another one. So this is Betty. So she's talking about, um, you know, in her school, general educators kept interfering when her students were having behavioral crises and trying to get involved in ways that were not helpful. And, and there was lots of drama around her students' behavior. 
And so she said, we were able to take over some of the staff meetings. We had voluntary trainings in the mornings. We really got out there. We talked to the PTO. We talked to the CPAC. And, and that gave us a lot of direction in terms of who to reach out to. So they started educating their community more broadly about how to support their program. And then finally, communicating successes. So Greta talked about how other people seeing her students be successful, and she had a tremendously successful program, incredibly successful program, but how that, that made it easier for her to negotiate these tensions in subsequent years. So, you know, the big picture is that their jobs require negotiating pretty complex network of adult relationships, um, and that brings with it a lot of tensions. Uh, they employ a lot of strategies to negotiate those tensions, and we basically don't know anything about that, and so that's another thing that, like, <laughs> we need to research. Um, so what are the various ways that, uh, what are the effects of the ways that uh, coordination with colleagues uh, uh, has on students, uh, what is, or on teachers? What does it have on their stress, their retention, their instructional quality? Are there common sources of tension that we could probably systematically address or structurally address? Are there, um, you know, uh, what strategies that teachers employ are more or less effective? Um, in negotiating those tensions? Are those things that we can teach people to do and then see effects on, on their experiences? Um, how can we support teachers in managing those tensions? I think those are all good questions that are worth answering. Um, so I want to, um, I want to conclude with just a, a plea to always think about the teacher in context. Um, and I also want to share just what I would like to see us as a community do over the next 30 or 40 years. Um, I would like for us to be able to give leaders systems and policies and practices that make it really, really easy for them to identify gaps in their support for special educators and for teachers more broadly, including gaps in teachers' knowledge as well as gaps in teachers' support systems. Um, I would like to make it easier for them to identify what are effective strategies to address those gaps, how can they enact those strategies with support, and then monitor the success of those strategies and implementation. I would like, we do not have an evidence base to, to help administrators do this right now. But I, I think we need one. So to get us there, we need data systems. We need to know what to measure, for whom, how to measure it accurately. So we need to measure it differently for different populations of teachers. Some of the work that I've done has shown that the measures that work for general educators are slightly different from the measures that work with special educators because they have different roles. Um, we need to investigate what are the strategies we can use to change working conditions and what effects do those have? Um, which working conditions are most important to improve? For whom? Under what circumstances? Why? How do we improve them? So what's effective to, to what are effective strategies for changing working conditions? What's feasible for leaders? What's sustainable over time? And so we just really need a community of researchers doing that kind of work. Um, and I have a whole bunch of, uh, you know, if you want references, they're all there. But um, <laughs> thoughts, questions, et cetera. I felt like you're way too young to have been following me back in the 90s when I was still in the classroom. <laughs> it's sad that that, like that experience was. And I remember coming home one day from work and I was pregnant and my husband was ADD, and I was like, you get a job this year, I'm not going back there. And it's just so sad that, yeah. you know, that the conditions haven't, that they're maybe slightly changed, what those thought buckets are that are putting that pressure on you, but yeah. <coughs> like, that's what you do with work. Thanks. Yeah. I, th I think we haven't, we haven't done the work as like a scholarly community to change it. Like, we, we've done a lot of, um, we, we have, there's a robust body of research on intent to lead that is descriptive in nature, right? That shows us relationships between working conditions and intent to lead. Um, no one's taken that and then said, can we improve these things? And what does it look like to improve them? And I think it's really complex to think about improving it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's probably, maybe that's part of why. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was really interested that teacher experience was almost completely explained, like the relationship between teacher experience and burnout was almost completely explained by the variables that you included really to focus those conditions and yeah. focus. And I'm wondering like how much variable because you're looking at a sample that's like particularly prone to burnout, like how much variability was there in, in the survey? In, in their burnout or in their emotional exhaustion? Yeah, and yeah. like um, how should we think about that in other populations or how general, you know, I'm yeah. just really intrigued by that notion. Yeah, so uh, the model explained about 58% of the variance in intent to stay, which was uh, a lot. 
Um, we did have a full variability, like a, a full range of folks who intended to stay for a long time. Um, I'm, I'm not remembering right now what the distribution was like for the, the emotional exhaustion variable, but my recollection is that it was a, there was a full range, like there were folks who were not at all emotionally exhausted and then folks who were very, but it was uh, skewed. <laughs> it was skewed towards the more emotionally exhausted side. Um, and so yeah, it's possible that it will look really different. Like it's possible that if you, if you were looking at a population of general educators who had lower burnout rates, that you might see personal factors, for example, explaining a larger proportion of the variance, um, and therefore these ones explaining less. And that would be a really interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm curious, based on your findings from the second study, and then considering the first study and the importance of planning time, if you considered for planning time, if there's differences in the effectiveness of individual planning time for teachers versus group planning time, and if possibly in group planning time, there's more management of these other adults and that kind of thing, and whether it's obviously there's a difference between co-teaching and a self-contained classroom, but I yeah. think it's important like when teachers were reporting on planning time, what did that look like? Yeah, and we didn't look at collaborative planning because um, we, we've almost never seen this population of teachers have collaborative planning. Um, I, I think it's, uh, Sometimes they do have it, but they have it with other teachers who are also teaching self-contained classes for kids with EBD, and so then that time gets devoted to like behavioral management systems. Um, so we, we didn't look at that in this particular study, but I think it's a great question. And I think um, what we found in a, an analysis that I did of uh, uh, this data set that Peter collected quite a few years ago was that um, ratings, and so we didn't look at collaborative planning time, but we looked at collegial interactions. <coughs> Um, and for special educators, the more collegial interactions they were having, the more manageable they felt their workloads were, but for general educators, it was the opposite. Um, and we, there's, a, there's a lot of hypotheses you could generate about why that was. Um, one of our hypotheses from that was that the mean number of collegial interactions that special educators was having was really low, whereas the mean number for beginning general educators was really high. And so it's possible that there's actually like a, a quadratic relationship such that like too few or too many can be overwhelming. <laughs> um, and so I, yeah, I think it's a, a really interesting question and worth looking at. And we know that teachers learn through that collaborative planning time that they become more effective um, from work that uh, your, your postdoc folks are, are doing, right? Um, so I think that's an important question and worth looking at. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering more about that relationship that you saw that was kind of between the number of paraprofessionals and I think that's yeah. And I, I'm not super familiar with the structure of creation models, so I might not completely understand, but it seems like you ran a uh, number of paraprofessionals separately from some of the things that are expected to be correlated. Like, like student, number of students? Number of students? Yeah, we tested okay. that. We okay. tested whether, we put, uh, we did a post hoc test where we tested the, those in the same model to see if the effect would disappear, and it, it did not. We also tested a, an interaction between those two, and the interaction was not significant. Um, one, one possibility is that the, the, way, the way we phrased that question could have been problematic. So we were asking about um, the number of full and part-time paraprofessionals, and we weren't able to break those apart. So you can imagine that if someone has five part-time paraprofessionals who are in their class each for like a period, that's gonna be super overwhelming versus having five full-time folks who you, you know, have more time with. And, and unfortunately, we're not able to break that up with that, with the way we structured the item. So that's something we will do differently next time. <laughs> do you think it could also be like, sometimes you have a one-on-one, -on -one and then like, you're gonna be more likely to have kids that are more, like everybody's gonna need their own individual yeah. work if there's a lot of one-to-ones in the room that's just the severity yeah. of the student or the difference of the students. Yeah, as opposed to like three paraprofessionals work across all of the kids, who, yeah. and because the, the kids' needs aren't as significant. And hopefully there's a little bit of attitude the needs of the kids. Right? Yeah. It's really hard when you have a small population of kiddos. And, and I, I think also, I think that's probably part of it. That could very well be part of it. I think another possibility is just that it's it's a lot to supervise these people, you know? <laughs> and, so, and we do not train, we don't we don't train our pre-service teachers to do that effectively. Um, and so that's, that's, it just might be that it's more overwhelming. And I think oftentimes with administrators, when you tell them like, oh, we need to figure out better ways to support these group of teachers, they're like, oh great, I'll give them another para. <laughs> Are you gonna give them time to train the para? Are you gonna give them time to coordinate that para's work? Is the para trained? Um, Greta and Fiona, the teachers uh, from the second study, they, uh, they have advocated progressively for more personnel in their, in their program. 
Um, they have five students. It, the program is co-taught by a VCBA and a special educator. They have five paraprofessionals in the class. Three of them are ABA trained. That's an entirely different thing than what happens in most classes, where it's the five folks who apply to the job, right? If you have five. If you have five folks apply, right, yeah. <laughs> I'm curious if you talk about these findings with administrators and what their reactions are. Yeah, um, so I do. I do talk about it with administrators, and oftentimes they look at me like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> um, it, it depends on the administrator. Um, all of the administrators who were in that the second study that I shared, I've gone back and, sh and shared our results with them. Um, they feel very overwhelmed, and they don't feel efficacious to change a lot of the things that we're talking about. Um, and so that's something... Um, I don't know, I think that, that's a direction for future research, is to look at are there people who are changing these things and then how, how are they funding it? Um, how are they coordinating within the district? How are they, get, how are they getting buy-in from the superintendent to hire a couple you know, more certified folks? And, um, so s some administrators, they, they, uh, they look at me with deer the headlights. I met with an administrator the other day who's uh, he's very slick and public facing, and he was like, oh, I'm so, I feel so good because I'm doing all these things. And I was like, I was in your school. This is, this, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, I was in your school all year last year. You're like the jerk who I was explaining all the stories about a jerk or about you. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> but he, it was just totally like lack of reflection. Whereas other people are like, they really want to be doing these things, and they don't necessarily feel efficacious to do so. Yeah. I mean, administrators are super overwhelmed, as just as teachers are. Um, so this pertains to your second study in particular. Um, I would wonder about the generalizability of the, so like as a inclusion teacher, yeah. we put the, the circle of like the yeah. teachers between adults. I was like, oh, that was my life for the last three yeah. years. So I think yeah. that's an interesting line of research of looking at mm -hmm. across special education teachers. Yeah. Um, and I would wonder if, if that inclusion factor is really mm -hmm. what differentiates the different types of uh, special education teachers that we have yeah. now. And that, and that component of their role. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thing to, to think about. And I would, Im I would imagine you're right, that you would find a, a similar kind of experience. Um, where it might be different is the involvement of the district. Um, I think that these programs, because they draw students from across the district, the district has a, a different kind of investment than they do in like a typical LD or co-teaching setting. Uh, that probably also varies district to district. But. Wondering, so I know that another component of the burnout scale is personal accomplishment, which yeah. is sort of this positive psychology gen and uh -huh. stuff that oriented work, uh, which is really important to understand sort of where where people aren't thriving like they should be. But I'm wondering if you or others have thought about how to leverage some of that related to this work to sort of pick up on where where teachers yeah. are seeing bright spots related to their own efficacy around their own work. Yeah. So uh, my colleague Nelson Brunsting is doing a, uh, he just got Spencer funding to do a, a study that, that's doing something similar. So what he's doing is he's looking at uh, teachers in these settings, self-contained classes for kids with ABD, and the trajectory of their burnout development over the course of the year. And then within that, he's going to be selecting the teachers who have particularly low rates of burnout. And unlike our study where we only had emotional exhaustion, he's got all three components of burnout that he'll be measuring. Um, and so then he'll be going into those contexts where they um, experience lower rates of, of burnout overall and interviewing folks and, and finding out more about their context. So he's doing kind of exactly what you're, what you're thinking about, looking at positive deviance with relation to burnout. So that's a great idea. I mean, I can't think of a study in Gen Ed that, is, that has all of the variables that we had here and, and the, the kind of model. There are, there are some folks who are doing some really sophisticated stuff with large-scale data sets um, that, you know, they don't have the, all the Likert scales that we had in our survey um, that are, are finding a lot of these variables are, are also related to general education teachers' outcomes. 
But I think that there are probably some key differences that you would find if you, like if you replicated this study with general educators, there's a few key differences. So one is, is what, what you were pointing out, just that on average the burnout rates are likely to be a little bit lower. Um, and that means that your model might explain a, a smaller proportion of the variance in the outcomes. Um, another really important one is that most of these teachers are the only person in their school doing this job. Whereas your average general educator has colleagues who are doing the same job. So this is something that, that Peter's written about very thoughtfully, that um, especially for novices, this is true for, it's, it's true for all, I think all teachers, that you, you need colleagues who understand what you're doing and who you can talk to about your work. Um, but that is especially true for beginning teachers, and I, I think that's where um, general educators typically have that. They have another third grade teacher who teaches the same curriculum. They have another, you know, if they're teaching 10th grade physics, they've got another 10th uh, grade science teacher who maybe not isn't teaching physics, but who has taught it or has some expertise or, or has a role that's roughly similar. Um, and so those are some things that might make it quite different. Um, you'll notice that our scale didn't include a collegial, and like didn't a, a collegial support variable. We included school culture variables because our experience has been that these teachers, there's just really low variance in the rate at which they interact with their colleagues. Um, and so. It, it wasn't a variable we chose to include, chose to think about school culture more broadly, um, which was actually came out of a study that Sarah, Emily, and I did a few years ago where we found that teachers would say, oh yeah, my colleagues are great, they're wonderful, everyone's really really nice, and then you'd like, but they didn't actually do anything <laughs> with their colleagues or talk to them, right? They're, like the, the most collaboration we saw was one teacher who said, oh yeah, sometimes they give me, they give me materials if I ask for it. Right, <laughs> and so that—that's that, something that I hope is different for general educators. So maybe I'm wrong, but um, I have a question, kind of specifically about the intent to leave construct. Mm -hmm. um, so, firstly, uh, this might be a, a silly question. So, how highly correlated is that with actually leaving? So uh, we actually don't really know that. <laughs> we really should. Um, there was a paper in 2001 that found uh, a 0.69 correlation um, with, in, with actual leaving within the following 15 months. Uh, but that was in 2001. Um, so I'm, I'm hesitant to say that it's the same now. I, I would imagine that the, the strength of the correlation would vary depending on the labor market. Mm -hmm. So that when the, when, the economic, when economic conditions are strong, probably it's a, low, a, a higher correlation. And when economic conditions are weak, it's probably a lower correlation because people don't have choices about other jobs and, and where to go. And the yeah. second part of that question yeah. is the intent to leave the profession or their school? So we actually had um, three items that w were about each kind of component. So the profession, the school, and then the population of students. Um, so we're thinking about those as kind of uh, highly correlated. They, they were highly correlated with one another and, and interactive with one another. Um, there are people who have looked at it as intent to leave this school, intent to leave special education, um, intent to leave teaching overall, who have like kind of separated those into different scales. Um, and, and there are slightly different findings. Like there is value for sure in separating those out. Um, we had like a, one of the pieces of feedback that one of our expert reviewers gave us was that our survey was way too long. <laughs> so so we, didn't, we didn't separate those out, but yeah. <laughs> 